Hello everyone and welcome to the first of three online events celebrating the poets and translators shortlisted for this year's Sarah Maguire Prize for Poetry in Translation. The Sarah Maguire Prize is an international biennial award for the best book of poetry in English translation by a living poet from Africa, Asia, Latin America or the Middle East. The prize was established in memory of the poet Sarah Maguire, who was the founder of the Poetry Translation Center and a champion of international poetry. The aim of the prize is to showcase the very best contemporary poetry from around the world and to champion the art of poetry translation. 10 days ago, judges Kit Fan, Q Li and Chair Rosalind Harvey announced a six strong shortlist for this year's award including poets from the Republic of Congo, Korea, Mauritius, Mexico, Palestine and Syria. The winning book will be announced on the 1st of November and the winning poet and their translators will share a £3,000 award. Before then, over the course of this month, the Poetry Translation Centre, in partnership with the British Council, is sponsoring a series of bilingual readings and discussions, each featuring two of the shortlisted poet-translator pairs. Subsequent events are scheduled for the 11th of October and the 27th of October, and uh, the link for further information is uh, in the chat. Today's event, is hosted by the British Centre for Literary Translation at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. My name is Duncan Large and I'm the BCLT's Academic Director. We're showcasing two of the shortlisted works today, Migrations, Poem 1976 to 2020 by Gloria Gervitz, translated by Mark Schaefer, published by New York Review Books, and Unexpected Vanilla by Lee Hemi, translated by Soje and published by Tilted Axis Press. Now, as you may know, uh, Gloria Gervitz sadly passed away earlier this year, but she will be present in the form of archive recordings introduced by Mark Schaefer, uh, who is in Boston and will also be reading from his translations. The first half of our event will be chaired by my BCLT colleague, Tom Ball. And then in the second half, we'll hear from Lee Hemi, accompanied by her interpreter, Jenny Jung, and her translator, Soje, who are in London. Unfortunately, uh, Nick Chapman of the Poetry Translation Center, who put this event together, has come down with COVID but he's uh, uh, in the audience today and we wish him a speedy recovery. Now, uh, this event is being recorded uh, and there will be time uh, at, towards the close for your questions. Uh, so do please um, use the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar to put your questions throughout the event uh, to our, uh, our speakers and uh, then uh, I will put them uh, on your behalf to our speakers uh, toward the end of the event. The uh, chat will be uh, available uh, throughout and as I say Q&A please by preference for your questions to the speakers. So without further ado uh, I'd like to hand over to my colleague uh, Tom Ball uh, who is going to be chairing uh, the first half of our event. Tom. Hello and uh, good afternoon everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Mark Schaefer to read with us today. Uh, Mark has translated numerous Mexican poets, uh, numerous Mexican authors, including Alberto Ruiz Sanchez, Alberto Blanco and David Huerta, who very sadly passed away on Monday. Mark works very closely with the authors that he translates, and he's been a great advert, uh, advocate for Mexican poetry in the English speaking world. He's received numerous grants and awards for his translations, including the Robert Fitzgerald Prize and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. 
Today, Mark will be reading from his translation of Migraciones, Migrations, by the Mexican poet Gloria Herbitz. Herbitz began writing Migrations in 1976. And the poem went through multiple expansions and revisions, incorporating new material over a period of 44 years. It was a lifelong poetic project. It's notable for the dominance of female voices and references to Jewish liturgy and textual traditions. Herbitz's parents were Ashkenazi Jews who came to Mexico, or her grandparents rather, were Ashkenazi Jews who came to Mexico from Russia and Poland at the start of the 20th century. A poem is, among other things, a form of cultural memory for that diasporic experience. And she draws on the Greek poet George Seferis for the epigraph to one of the sections of migrations. Memory aches wherever it is touched. So I'd like to hand over to Mark now and to some recordings of Gloria Herbitz reading uh, her poem. Thank you, Tom, that, for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, I'm glad you mentioned David Huerta. I'm, I'm reeling a bit from one loss after another because uh, I also translated uh, a lot of his poetry. Um, and at the same time, their, the po their poetry and their voices still resonate and fill my head and my heart. And um, I'm glad to be able to share with you uh, videos of Gloria reading um, the sections in Spanish from a reading we did at a City Lights bookstore at <laughs> Meaning Online in, uh, this past December. So I'm just going to start with uh, Gloria introducing both uh, her poem and sort of our relationship of, as author translator. I'm very happy, of course, to be with Mark Schaefer, my translator, that I, I mean, I think it's a, a very strange and I would say beautiful thing. Um, and we never, neither him or I ever imagined this, but uh, what I have is really just one single long poem that I worked with for 44 years. And strangely, like I just said, Mark Schaefer has been, of course, both of us on and off. He has been translating this poem for 30 years. He, he uh, got in touch with me in 19, so, and we are, as you know, in 21, so that's 30 years, and um, of having a relationship, like we, I said, off and on. Uh, of course, we have become friends, good friends, close friends, and, um, well, I'm, I think I'm very lucky to have had a translator that had been interested in my poem for 30 years and sort of making this long journey that it, 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 it ended up being, I never imagined that when I started, uh, a life project for me. So that's all that I want to say. And I want to thank you, Mark, for really being with me in this long journey that we're, to, we're still together here. So we're going to start, if anyone is following the, the uh, English, this is uh, page 170 from the middle of the book. And, uh, and I'm going to play her reading the original and then I will read in the English translation. Y afuera del mercado, aves del paraíso, y azucenas, y margaritas, y alelis, y orquídeas desnudas como animales, y raíces como manojos, de venas verdes, y jacintos, y crisantemos, y lilas, y menúmpares, y heliotropos, y anturios, y jazmines, y hortensias con el color quebrado, y azalias con las ramas quebradas, gardenias ahogándose en sus pétalos y naufragándose perfumadas de seda en el kimono de una geisha inconsolables ráfagas de girasoles, ramos de cempasúchicul para los difuntos y las flores doblándose. 
y los vivos pasándose la botella de aguardiente y música y música y más música y la triste tristeza de los muertos ensordeciéndose y tan apisonada la tristísima y tan sorda y tan morida y tan muerta que ya ni sabe lo muertísima que está. Y las flores llorándose y los vivos viviéndose y tragándose su vida, a goterones tragándosela, tragándose su miedo. Y tanto ajetreo la vida, y tantos días de estar apelados, y la calor como alma en pena, y el deseo mordiéndose el corazón y envenenándolo como picadura de, de alacrán. Y azares para las novias que ya probaron el amor. Y azares para las quedadas y las de la primera comunión y para las que se matrimoniaron con Dios y se quedaron con el himen intacto. Thank you. And outside the market, birds of paradise and lilies and daisies and wallflowers and orchids naked as animals and roots like bunches of green veins and hyacinths and chrysanthemums and lilacs and water lilies and heliotropes and anthuriums and jasmine flowers and hydrangeas with washed out colors and azaleas with broken branches, gardenias drowning in their petals and foundering in the perfumed silk of a geisha's kimono, inconsolable gusts of sunflowers, bouquets of sempasuchil for the departed and the flowers drooping and the living passing the bottle of aguardiente and music and music and more music and the sorrowful sorrow of the dead growing deafening and the most sorrowful of all so trampled and so deaf and so died and so dead that she no longer even knows how deadified she is and the flowers weeping and the living living and guzzling their lives guzzling it in big gulps and guzzling their fear and life is such commotion and so many days peeled away and heat like a tormented soul and desire biting the heart and poisoning it like a scorpion sting and orange blossoms for the brides who've already tasted love and orange blossoms for the spinsters and the girls receiving first communion and for the women who have married God and preserved their hymen intact. Sí, hoy de no me olvides y los pansies de D. H. Lawrence abriendo y veo iris, plisias y malbones y petunias y violetas y tulipanes y dalias y nopalillos acalorados y hoscos y cactus secándose en sus macetas de barro y coronas de Cristo, vertiéndose en sangre de corales y la sangre cubriéndose de espinas. Y alas de pavo real mirándose con los ojos muy abiertos y atados de heno y de alfalfa para el ganado y atados de juncos y plumas de avestruz y caléndula y racimos de estrellas y atados de pico de tucán y atados de claveles rojo, rojos y rosas, muchas rosas. Y ahí está la muchacha que pintó Diego Rivera con los alcatraces y olvidada en una caja de habanos. <coughs> la fotografía de la abuela rusa en Xochimilco en una trajinera cargada de alcatraces. Y veo a mi abuela poblana en su casona de las lomas, y es la canícula desbordándose, y el aire se tiñe de pétalos, y la veranda de tan blanca se me pierde, y yo me pierdo en el recuerdo, y veo a mi mamá poniéndole alcatraces a un jarrón de talavera, y en la radio están tocando los boleros que tanto le gustan, y veo a mi nana, y veo a esa niña que soy yo, llevándole alcatraces a mi mamá y me veo hoy, ahora, aquí, aquí después de todos estos años y tengo en un florero, y tengo en un florero 
unos alcatraces y estoy oyendo los mismos boleros que el tiempo se diluye en muchos tiempos y mi vida está hecha de muchas vidas. And bouquets of tiny white clouds and ecstatic daffodils and bouquets of Queen Anne's lace and forget-me-nots and D.H. Lawrence's pansies opening in all their beauty and begonias and geraniums, irises, freesias and paralagoniums and petunias and violets and tulips and dahlias and nopalillos hot, bothered and surly and cactuses shriveling in their clay pots and thorny crowns of Christ dripping coral blood and the blood blooming with thorns and peacock wings gazing at one another eyes wide open and bales of hay and alfalfa for cattle and bales of rushes and ostrich feathers and calendulas and clusters of stars and bundles of heliconia and bundles of red carnations and roses, plenty of roses. And there's the girl Diego Rivera painted with the calla lilies. And the photograph of my Russian grandmother in Xochimilco on a punt piled high with calla lilies, now forgotten in a cigar box. And I see my grandmother from Puebla in her mansion in Las Lomas, and the dog days of summer are overflowing and petals stain the air. And the veranda so white, it vanishes from my sight and I vanish into the memories. And I see my mother placing calla lilies in a Talavera pitcher. And on the radio, they're playing the boleros she likes so much. And I see my nanny and I see that girl who is me bringing my mother calla lilies. And I see myself today, now, here, here after all these years and in a vase i have some calla lilies and i'm listening to the same boleros my mother listened to and time dissolves into multiple times and my life is made up of multiple lives uh, i hope you caught the beginning of that section which started outside the market because the context is uh, a memory of uh, a bustle, the bustling central market in Oaxaca, the city of Oaxaca, Mexico. We're going to read uh, next um, uh, the, the end of the poem, the la what used to be the last section before she took out all of the section dividers and, and much more transforming the poem radically from what it had been for over 30 years into its final uh, version. Um, we are in the English starting on page 250 and Spanish 256. Dijo, yo soy la palabra, yo soy la que nace naciéndose de sí misma. Ábrete para que te llene de mí. Ábreme tu sexo, ábremelo y siente cómo penetro y te fecundo. Ábrete al placer de estar preñada de lo que no puede decirse y que ahora sabes. Siéntelo. Deje. No tengas mí. Aquí, en ti y contigo. Gózame y goza tu vida. La única y tuya y de ti y para ti. Esta es la única eternidad que tendrás nunca. Date a luz a ti misma, empújate hacia afuera y nómbrame. She said, I am the word. I am she who is born giving birth to herself. Open yourself that you may be filled by me. Open your sex for me. Open it and feel how I penetrate and impregnate you. Open yourself to the pleasure of being pregnant with what cannot be said and which you now know, feel it, let it flood you. Don't be afraid, I'm here, here in you and with you. Rejoice in me and in your life, the only one and yours and of you and for you 
This is the only eternity you will ever have. Give birth to yourself. Push yourself out and name me. I'm going to jump a page to in span in the English, page 252. Dice, toca, sientes, sientes como te desborda <clears throat> ese fluir, ese gozo, míralo, no se dice, es tú misma, tú en ti. Hablo de los pulsos, no, no es la luz, es tú, tú en luz, el corazón en luz, luz disuelta en clorofila. ¿La oyes? Fluye, se inclina, dócil, húmeda, dice, escuchas, es tu respiración. Y lo que hubiese querido ser, y más, y más, no es que pueda explicar, pero esto soy yo. Estos, los días, la vida. <coughs> ¿Y en qué parte de mí estoy? ¿A dónde? Y esta alegría casi azul, como un lote baldío, parece un águila, un quetzal. ¡Ey, no te vayas! Dice una voz dentro de mí. Quédate. She says, touch. Do you feel it? Do you feel it overflow you? That flow, that joy, look at it. It is unspoken. It is yourself, you in you. I speak of the pulsing. It's not the light. It's you steeped in light. Your heart steeped in light. Light dissolved in chlorophyll. Can you hear it? It flows, leans, gentle, moist, says, do you hear? It's your breath. And what you would have wished to be and more and more, I can't explain it, but this is what I am. These are the days, life, and where in me am I? Where? And this joy verging on blue like a vacant lot is like an eagle, a quetzal. Hey, don't go, says a voice inside me. Stay. Estoy. Me dejo estar. Oigo mi respiración, que es también la tuya. No sé a quién le hablo. El viaje en lo más solo necesita ser compartido. Y la luna donde se ahogó Lipo baja hasta el estanque y yo, que siempre soy otra y la misma, aquí, en este año de mi edad que son todos los años, aquí, en el calor del final del verano, en esto que siento, alta, indómita, como una secuoya, como una yegua joven, súbita, impredecible y en su vuelo la palabra, ahí donde la luz se dobla, el sol entre los narcisos, deslumbrado, ¿qué hago con tanta belleza? Y si me quedara sin palabras, Marco. I'm here and let myself stay. I hear my breath, this is, that is also yours. I don't know whom I'm speaking to. The journey through the loneliest place has to be shared. And the moon in which Lipo drowned drops into the pool and I who am always other and myself here in this year of my life that is every year. Here in the heat of the end of summer, here where I feel tall, invincible, like a sequoia, like a young mare, fleet and unpredictable. And in flight, the word there where the light bends, the sun astonished among the narcissi. What do I do with so much beauty? And if I found myself without words? Atrévete. Dame, come de mi mano, desbordame, palabra de toda misericordia, vas a dejarme, y si digo, es el alma, digo algo, ¿a dónde es que he estado, que estoy, 
¿A dónde se me fue la vida, la vivida? ¿A dónde la por vivir? Y si hubiera sido otra, sería la misma otra. No tengo más vida que esta que me vive y yo con ella. En ella, en esto que soy y en esto otro que también soy y que no sé qué es. Mía de mí, mi vida toda. Y si supiera, ¿qué sabría? Amasijo de luz, desembocadura, la claridad, como si se le acabara el corazón. Se está así en Dios, en lo que llamamos Dios. Y yo allí, como quien mira, como quien oye, yo la intrusa, la de ti presentida, espera y tiembla el humano temblor de ante ti. Y falta el aire, ah, esperada, en tu gozo reclamo lo que colmado colma. ¿Quién es esa que me hace ser la que soy? ¿Y para qué? ¿Y por qué es que soy? Be bold. Give me. Eat from my hand. Overflow me, word, in your bounteous mercy. Will you leave me? And if I say it's the soul, what am I saying? Where have I been? Am I now? What did my life, where did my life go? The one I lived, where? The one I've yet to live. And if I'd been someone else, I'd be the same someone else. I have no other life than this one that lives me. And I with her, in her, in what I am, and in what else I also am, and know not what it is. Mine, my own, my life, all together. And if I'd known, what would I know? Siente, si puedes, siente, sientes, inunda, penetra, duélese allí en su belleza, dueles en ti, dice, tómame, ábreme, ábrete en mí. Y la alegría doblega, profundo, duele, duele su belleza tosca, su silencio. Duele. Y el cielo de septiembre baja hasta mí cálido y cubierto de niebla. Y yo, que un día moriré, estoy aquí, en este instante que es todos los instantes, estoy viva. Oh, okay. I think I missed part of it. Um, I'm gonna read. I missed. Uh, I'm gonna read the ending. Uh, the last two ones that she. I'm not sure exactly how I got confused, but um, needing of light, river mouth, brightness, as if her heart had failed, as it is in God and what we call God, and there I am, like someone watching, like someone listening. I, the intruder, the one you foretold, wait and tremble, that human trembling in your presence, and there's no air. Ah, you who I've been waiting for in your joy, I ask for that which satisfied satisfies. Who is that who makes me who I am and what for and why am I? And this is the part that she just read, the end. Feel, yes, you can, feel. Do you feel it? It drenches, penetrates, aches. There in its beauty, it aches in you. She says, take me, open me, open yourself in me. And joy bows deeply, aches. Its coarse beauty aches, its silence aches. And September sky drops down to me, warm and covered in fog. And I, who one day will die, am here in this moment that is every moment I am alive. Thank you very much, Mark. It was, um, it was very moving to see that footage of Gloria there and then to hear you, hear you reading your translations. Um, I'm always interested in translation about how translators first sort of come across works and that sort of that initial moment of discovery and then the sort of the desire, the impulse to translate. So I'd like to ask you first, could you tell us how you first discovered 
Gloria Herbitz's work and what first attracted you to it? That's a very interesting and central question to the whole project I ended up doing with Gloria. Um, the, the first part is, is uh, sort of funny and at this point anachronistic. I was in Mexico, I had lived there for many years and then left and I was visiting and uh, I read in a literary journal a review of what turned out to be the first time, the first publication of her poem where she had put together what she had written so far under the title of Migraciones, Migrations. And I was fascinated. By, there were just a few excerpts, but it fascinated me. And um, I think one of the things that fascinated me was um, that at the center of this excerpt and really of the poem um, was this uh, woman, uh, an ordinary woman who's just, who, who we're, we're seeing. And there was something so powerful about that. Um, and I think the un uh, underlying part of my interest and attraction to Gloria's project was also that turns out we, we um, uh, all of my grandparents uh, were uh, Eastern European Jews who came to the, the Americas, uh, Northern America in the um, early part of the 20th century. And, uh, and so our lives were very parallel. And I, and I think I sent someone writing about something that seemed very familiar uh, in a family level, but then at the literary level, there was a whole other thing that even from her earliest publication in 1979 is just unusually powerful. So the, the, the literal answer to your question, how did I, uh, uh, find her work and get uh, start working with her is that I I tried to find the book in a bookstore and I couldn't find it anywhere and so uh, this was 1991 and I uh, looked her up in the Mexico City phone book and I found her and I called her and we met and um, the rest as they say is history Uh, yeah, well, uh, thank you, thank you, Mark. I mean, I think that's a fascinating story of the kind of the early happenstance of the discovery through the uh, the literary journal, and then that once uh, once you discovered her work, that strong sense of affinity, and also kind of remarkable persistence as well. Actually, sort of getting on the phone to her, and you know, I think we're all sort of very grateful for that, uh, you know, for your sort of efforts and that sort of that early encounter there with you know, this opportunity now to sort of know this poem in English. Now, I'd also like to sort of talk to you um, about the sort of composition of the, the poem and how you worked with that uh, as a translator. I think you said earlier on that, that, that Gloria transformed the poem radically over that sort of period of over 40 years. And it strikes me also that your actual work as a translator as a uh, has sort of taken place over a number of years as well. So um, I was thinking that as migrations went through those multiple uh, revisions uh, since Gloria started writing it in 1976, um, you've then been translating a poem that has been changing actually as you translated it. So I was wondering what particular challenges that presented for you? Mm. Um, another fascinating topic, uh, just as she said, I never imagined when I called her or when I started translating what then was, I forget how long it was, maybe 60 pages, um, a poem that, that this project, that this relationship, <laughs> that this work would continue for 30 years. Um, and at the beginning, I, you know, I just, I found the poem fascinating and um, uh, uh, rich and, and um, uh, really drew me in at so, at so many levels. And um, I, it, in my mind, there were really two junctions that were um, very challenging and uh, where I really had to decide whether I could continue on the journey with her. Um, the beginning of the poem, 
a, in in a to to with less intensity than that first section that I read for, that we read from from the market scene um, is very lush with imagery and and long lines and um, and uh, and that was the bulk of the poem when I came to it in 1991. But but she one of the things that she had she said herself that um, I, I forget exactly how she said it, but just the, that she's the bane of editors and, and a translator would probably be a good addition to that because um, her poem was always a living poem and uh, she kept writing and kept revising. So in early in 1993, she published what she understood it at that point to be a new poem, Pythia, uh, it, it then she wrapped it into the poem. It, it she realized it was part of this this whole single poem, and Pythia was uh, the the section was uh, one almost the opposite of language being uh, uh, pared down and dried down to uh, single lines of single words and and just a struggle. Um, to even uh, sort of the struggle to express oneself in in language and the ability of language to express human experience, um, and uh, I, I it was so different from what I had come to know so well and and love that um, it was really kind of a shock. And um, one of the things about Gloria is that she never did what she was supposed to do at any point. Um, and uh, she followed what she understood and and felt and was told in her opinion by the poem what the poem needed. It took a it took a, a few years for me to decide that I um, I could and wanted to continue on this journey with her. And it was quite it took a lot of recalibration on my part. Um, in addition to revising what I had done up till then. And then the second time, just very shortly, is, is in 19, I think it was 19, 2000, 2016, 2017, she's maybe a little bit earlier. Um, she started writing a huge amount. Uh, 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 it, it, she, was, she had moved to San Diego, and I think in a way, being far from Mexico, where this her life and the poem was so located, um, gave her the, a space that suddenly opened up. And she wrote a huge amount and published a new edition, the last edition, or the almost last in 2016, I think, 2017. And again, my experience of reading the poem and I had, I had intentionally not, she would send me things and I would not uh, look at them because it was too much to recalibrate again. And it took me another year. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if I liked the new version. I wasn't sure um, if I could follow her again. And finally, um, I decided that I was in this with her for the journey. And whether I thought it was, whether I liked the new version or not was not relevant. That, that what was relevant was that, that we were, I was doing this with her. I was on this journey. I was going where she went. And, uh, and then hopefully um, I was able to do that. Um, uh, thank you, Bart. I mean, I think that's an absolutely, I mean, a remarkable, uh, translation project and I think a remarkable account as well as of, of the relationship between the the translator and poet as well I mean the way you sort of describe you've described there that sort of affinity that you felt for the poem when you uh, first discovered it but then having to sort of confront a poem that's very different you know and think about your sort of relationship with it and to actually make that commitment to it um, you know, I think that's a, I mean, I think that's a, a really, you know, I think that's a wonderful sort of story about sort of translation, as well as, um, you know, a remarkable poem and a remarkable translation. And, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that you have persisted with it, Mark. And 
I'd just like to sort of thank you for sort of coming here today to share that with us. And I think it's, thank you. Uh, it, it's such a pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Thank you both. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tom. Um, Mark will uh, stay with us and be available uh, towards the end of the session um, for any questions. Uh, but at this point, we're going to turn to our second work. And can I invite uh, our, uh, can I invite Soje and yes, Soje and Emmy, hello. Lovely to Hello. see you to, to join us. And they're in London at the Poetry uh, Translation Center. Uh, and we're also joined by uh, Jenny Jung, who will be uh, interpreting for uh, Hemi. So we're going to turn now uh, to uh, Hemi's collection, Unexpected Vanilla in Soj's translation. And let me briefly uh, introduce uh, our uh, a poet, our translator, and the collection. Um, Lee Hemi is the author of three poetry collections and an essay collection. In 2006, at age 18, she became the youngest winner of the Jung Ang Literary Newcomers Prize after novelist Choi In Ho won in 1963. Her first collection, Ultraviolet, was published in 2011 by Changbi Publishers. Unexpected Vanilla was published in 2016 uh, by Munji Publications. It was translated into English by Soje and published by Tilted Access Press in 2020. It was shortlisted for the 2021 National Translation Award in Poetry. And uh, uh, Lee uh, Hyumi has recently completed a PhD in Korean literature at Korea University. Her translator, uh, Soje, is uh, a soul based writer and translator who graduated magna cum laude in English from the University of California, Berkeley, where they won the Dorothy Rosenberg Prize in Lyric Poetry and scholarships for their research on Oh Jung Hee and Toni Morrison. They served as Modern Poetry and Translations 2020 Writer in Residence and were shortlisted for the 2021 National Translation Award in Poetry, longlisted for the 2022 Penn Award for Poetry in Translation. In addition to Unexpected Vanilla, Soje is the translator of Choi Jin Young's To the Warm Horizon and Lee Soho's Catcalling. A member of the Smoking Tigers Translator Collective, they also make Chong, uh, Chogwa, uh, a quarterly e-zine featuring one Korean poem and multiple English translations. Unexpected Vanilla is a collection which explores through an extraordinarily fl uh, fluid form the sensual experience of the human body in slippery, surreal contact with a world of other bodies, human and animal, of vegetation and climate. It's a book of nature poetry, of erotic poetry, of poetry dramatizing the human experience, especially in its feminine inflection. Its poems celebrate the interior, the domestic, cupboards, cooking spaces, and dramatize its opening up to the outside in all its forms and to larger philosophical issues. It's sexy, but it's also unflinching in its acknowledgement of and fascination with rotting and decay. Lee explores the Korean language's scope for ambiguous gendering. Soje's translation exploits the timelessness of the gerund in English to evoke a simultaneity of experience that spans the separate poems. And the punning capacity of English to echo the slippery subject matter in assonant sounds which qualify and reinforce the sense Welcome both. It's uh, lovely to have you join us today. And I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Soje at this point, and I'm going to invite you to read uh, from your work uh, and invite uh, Lee Hemi also to read uh, in your original language uh, uh, poems. 
and then we'll uh, uh, afterwards we'll have time for brief discussion before opening up to uh, audience questions. So, Sojay, over to you. Thank you, Duncan, for that really wonderful introduction. I, I wish that I could interpret for any all the great things you just said. Um, but yeah, thank you again for all the contextualization. Um, we'll be reading four poems today and um, begin with World of Breaths. I think um, Hemi will read the source first. Am I thinking? Am I thinking? 잠든 이의 코에 손을 대어 본 사람은 영혼을 믿는 자다. 깊은 밤, 숨은 수풀을 지나 진창에 흐르고 깊이 젖어 고단한 채 돌아온다. 묵기 시작한 발자국을 따라가듯 먼저 잠든 이의 숨에 입김을 덮대어 호흡에 빗살을 엮으면 안쪽은 불타는 숲. 같은 휘도는 눈보라 아이를 꿈은 새처럼 날아간다 문득 다른 궤도로 진입하는 행성처럼 안개 잠든 새벽에만 들리는 소리가 있어 하나의 건물이 흰 들판으로 순하게 내려앉는 소리 젖은 길을 어루만지는 어렵고 약하고 투명하게 매 순간 새로 태어나는 시면을 바라보며 그 속에서 얼굴을 지운다 뒤섞여 들이우는 점차 짙어지며 스며드는 공기의 매듭 ever put their hand under the nose of the sleeping person who leaves in souls. Deep at night, breaths drift past the forest and flow in the mud, returning so If you weave the rays of respiration, joining your breaths with the sleepers, as if retracing footprints that have started to melt. Inside is the blazing forest. Outside is the whirling lizard. White bird, breaths fly in between the two, like planets suddenly entering another orbit. Some things you only hear at dawn, asleep, embrace. The sound of a dry leaf gently falling on a white field. The sound of a single wheel stroking a wet ear. Watching the abyss constantly be reborn, lightly, weakly, clearly, you raise your face, the knots of air, jumbled and suspended, deepen and seep into each other. And our next poem, is a fan favorite called the stuck <laughs> the cover with strawberry jam. Mm -hmm. <웃음> 딸기잼이 있던 찬장. 발끝을 힘껏 들고 높은 것을 더듬어 충분히 붉은 것들을 막 보았어. 입가를 온통 물들인 채 한상에 유도가 된 기분으로. 언니. 우린 분명 교묘히 어긋난 한 사람일 거야. 딸기에 어수선한 초록 왕관을 쓰고 이불 속에서 첫 몽정을 말하던 아침. 땀구멍마다 질긴 실을 하나씩 쓸어놓으며 우리는 함부로 은밀해지고 조금씩 말랑해졌지. 반투명 젤리 속 일렁이는 둘만의 왕국에서 나에게 여분의 계절이 있다면 우리가 사라지려는 새처럼 서둘러 속된 말들을 속삭이고 썩기 직전에 가장 달콤한 노래를 언니에게 선물했을 텐데 분홍만으로 이루어진 무지개를 옮기고 죄의식의 묘한 기쁨으로 
아침에 올빼미를 불러올 텐데. 손가락 사이로 달고 끈적한 것들이 흘러내릴 때 감춰야 할 것이 늘어버린 마음으로 한 개의 입술이 더 있었다면 한 쌍의 얇은 점막이 더 있었다면 뒤섞이며 짙어지는 맛들에 대해 함께 이야기할 수 있었을 텐데 오늘은 그저 길게 두 팔을 벌리고 옛 돌곰을 겪었지 우리가 아직 숨겨진 단 것을 사랑하다 그때. The cupboard was strawberry jam. We stood on our tiptoes and fumbled around the bookshelf to taste those red, red things. With mouths dyed all over, feeling like a pair of nipples. On the, we must be one person. Cunningly divergent. The morning we wore the disheveled green gowns of progress and spoke of our feet under the covers. We laid a chewy seed in every going recklessly private and graphic in the kingdom for two who sway inside translucent jelly. If I had a spare season, I would have rushed to whisper vulgar words. Bird with a disappearing beak, and gifted you the sweetest song on the bridge of rot. I would have squished the all pink rainbow and called the morning hour over the strange joy of guilt. Feeling like there is more to hide now is the sweet stickiness gripping my fingers. If we had another pair of lips, Another pair of thin mucous membranes. We could have talked about the flavors that deepen as they're mixed. But today, simply with our arms spread wide, we experience a readiness of old, of the days we love, hidden. Um, so this is before we move on to the third poem, I'm just reminded of um, sort of our ongoing joke about um, my gifting Hemi a dictionary of her own words in a way. I, I had compiled it before meeting her for the first time. I compiled all the words that reoccurred throughout the collection and their words like ilonginen or tjipinen. Um, and I, I love that the judges picked up on um, the constant, um, you know, flipping and blurring of um, directions and boundaries. And so I, I compiled all these words that she uses throughout the collection as a display of my attentiveness. And then she was horrified. <laughs> she was like, I'm, I'm going to stop using these words forever. And um, even as I was reading the first two, um, I was um, I came across, you know, verbs that recurred like tracing and deepening. So I, I was just having a private moment, <laughs> um, enjoying that. Um, so our third um, poem is the Body of God. Please be flowered. We got a woman. Orumu helped me out, or a matter of catchy. Take her to go. 낮술을 마시던 창가에서 그 희고 연약한 윤곽을 망쳐놓으며 너는 없는 아름다움을 말했다. 무심히 손을 휘저으며 미음과 리을 받침에 대해 이야기했지. 나는 알곡처럼 선연하다. 분명하여 부서지는 것들에 대해 같은 크기의 입자가 되어가는 것들에 대해 왜 부서져 떠돌다 실은 덩어리로 마무리되는 것일까? 입으로 불어도 손으로 쓸어도 자국을 남기던 눈송이들 얼어붙은 잔설이 회색으로 얼어붙은 그 창가에서 흰 가루라면 무엇이든 슬프던 계절이 생각나지 않아 지나간다. 눈처럼 녹아 사라질 줄 알았는데 끈질기게 혀에부터 끈적이는 더럽고 슬프고 무거운 
taste of flour. We stared our windows for a long time, licking ice by the window and cut cake and day drink. Brooding about fragile white outlines, soak of non existent beauty. Carelessly waving your hand about the letters X and L. An eye about what crumbles from being clear and distinct like rain, about what becomes uniform particle. Why do they crumble and wander and end up an awful lump? Those snowflakes stain where I came on them, swept them away with my hand. We mourn every white powder by the window, the refrozen snow was mottled gray. The season of such mourning passes by. I thought all powder was in the cold. No, but it's silent, stubbornly, my tongue, focused and sad. <laughs> Um, our um, titular poem. Pipoke <laughs> vanilla. Pipoke will tago, pudroke, bikrodoce. Mimu and your turtle tara hurrune. Grand hokete, vanilla. So she ran and she had the crow mumio. Kajang pupenjokin, pujongin idio. 두근거리며 이국의 이름을 외웠지. 그건 달콤에 대한 첫 번째 감각. 사라지는 것들에 대한 각별한 취향. 녹아내리는 손과 무릎이 있었지. 차갑고 먹게 흐르는 접촉이 서로를 빚어낼 때 소리의 영토 안에서 나는 세로로 누우고 끝에서 점차 태어나 다 녹으며 섞이는 꿈이라는 말 그런 바닐라 적당한 정도의 안구를 지니려 모르는 사람을 나는 가장 사랑하지 잃어버리는 순간 온전해지는 눈꺼풀이 있었다 순한 촉수를 흔들며 미끄러지다 흠뻑 쓰러지는 Unexpected vanilla. It glided along the groove of my ear. Vanilla on the tip of my tongue, dribbling down the subtle bump. We had to keep mutual expression while scraping all those seeds. With a fluttering heart, we memorized the names of foreign countries. Our first sensation of sweetness, a special appetite for impermanent things. Yes, some hands and knees were melting. We created each other, strokes running hot and cold. In the territory of sound, I'm a flower reclining vertically, blossoming before a fingertip. The word embrace melts and melds upon contact. That type of vanilla. To keep my eyeballs moist, I love most whom I don't know. Some eyelids grew whole the moment we lost them, slid and waved their gentle tentacles before falling, heavy with wet. Um, it's, it's evident that uh, you both get along so well, and that's not always the case with authors and translators. I know this isn't the first event that you've done together, um, and I was just wondering, um, did you collaborate on the translation? Soje, were you able to ask Hemi questions as you were translating, or did you only get to know each other after the translation was already finished? Um, I am definitely one of those translators who pester their authors a lot. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, Unexpected Vanilla was my first book-length project, and so I was 
extremely nervous in contacting her for the first time. Um, I had emailed her, you know, sort of shirking away saying, you know, I'm a student, but I really love your work. And I, this is what I'm getting from it. And this is what I'm interested in. You know, this is how I see the work and I want to bring it into English. And um, she was incredibly kind to me. And um, we got her um, work published first through Modern Poetry and Translation um, for their queer issue. And so through that special issue, we were able to have conversations around, you know, sexuality and queerness and how to write poems that aren't bound by pronoun, you know, the pronouns of the love of the beloved. And so we're having those conversations very early on in our virtual meeting over email. And then after months of me sort of asking different questions about um, some of the images, because, you know, she writes very surrealist works. And so sometimes when she talks about turning over summer, you know, how does summer turn over itself? You know, um, the Korean verb for it um, is a little bit more ambiguous in its directionality. So it could be like flipping over like a page, but it could be sort of like a, you know, inside out situation. So I had a lot of questions about the verb <laughs> to flip. So she's a little bit traumatized by that word now, which is why she's like, so yeah, I'm scared of you. Um, so I, I hope this is a sign that we still get along, but uh, um, yeah, I asked her uh, many questions over email and she was very generous in guiding me through this world of the second person as I wrote in my translator's note. And I think after a couple, maybe like half a year of emailing, we finally met in person while I was still living in Seoul, I don't anymore. And that was the day that I presented her with my list of <laughs> words from the collection. And that was for an interview I was doing for Words Without Borders. Um, and I just wanted to play this like game of word association and to get a better sense of um, this personal, I don't know, like dictionary that she has. And um, I am so grateful that she did not run away from me <laughs> from that first encounter. And now, you know, we're um, doing a book tour in London, you know, together this week. And um, we even do morning yoga together <laughs> on our hotel bed. So I'm, I'm so, so thankful that um, she really opened her heart to me through this collection, I've been able to collaborate in such a way. I'm really just grateful for this opportunity. You, men you mentioned the word uh, surreal uh, in your earlier answer, and I'm, I'm interested because clearly you're a very meticulous translator. You want to, uh, uh, you want to um, uh, work uh, intensively on individual uh, uh, terms, and would you say then that actually the the uh, uh, kind of uh, surreal um, uh, poetry that uh, Hemi um, writes is is more difficult to translate when you're not perhaps sure as a reader where uh, the sense is going to go? And as a translator, I mean, one could uh, take that as a license to be much freer in one's mm -hmm. translation. But it seems to me that actually, no, you're, it, it it's quite, has quite the opposite effect for you. Yeah, certainly. And I think it's, you know, translators vary by personality, you know, and I was much more interested, um, especially when I first Poet herself, you know, this is an incredible opportunity for me to learn about the inner workings of a poem. And I thought that um, it's basically like a one on one poetry tutorial <laughs> in, a, in a sense. Um, of course, I sought to bring in um, all of the um, intricacies of the English language as well. You mentioned the punning and the gerunds, and I really appreciate you for that kind of attentiveness to the work. Um, of course, I wanted to bring in um, something of my own into the translation and bring my own reading, but as you know, I have the great pleasure and honor of um, 
translating someone who is very much alive and very much, you know, online. So um, yeah, I want to share the mic, like literally <laughs> with, with uh, Hemi and uh, yeah, so that, that's my translational practice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, perhaps just a, a, a final uh, question from me at this stage. Um, I'm afraid I, I do not speak Korean, uh, but I, I um, understand. I, I, I'm wondering, um, as I read your uh, translation, Sojay, and I can see the kinds of um, well, slippery, slippery syntax that you're exploring in English. And I'm wondering, is this, uh, to what extent this is reflecting what's going on in the Korean? And I wonder if you could perhaps both say something about the relation between uh, the Korean and the English, because um, I know, Sojay, I, 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 in your uh, interview with Asintok, you said mm -hmm. uh, that, um, uh, uh, the lines I love most in Korean are often the hardest to translate into English. Mm -hmm. Frankly, it's a ridiculous <laughs> language pairing. And uh, I, I wonder if I could invite you just to say a little more uh, about, you know, the relation between the, the two languages and the difficulty then that that poses. Sure. Uh, I'd love to give Hemi a chance to speak. Google <laughs> 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 2인 삼각경기다 이런 얘기를 했었는데 근데 같이 이렇게 한 발을 묶고 달리는 그 경기처럼 서로에게 영향을 주고 받으면서 소통하면서 어 하나의 작품을 만들어 나간다는 것이 굉장히 의미 있게 느껴졌고요. 사실 한국어와 영어의 차이점을 영어를 잘 모르기 때문에 <웃음> 잘 알지는 못하지만 어 그것들을 이렇게 변화하면서 또 영어에 맞는 또 옷을 입었을 것이라고 생각합니다. I like to make the analogy um, of working with Soje as to running in a, ra a three-legged race where we are tied up, but we also have to keep up with the pace and, you know, work in hand in hand. And so the part about the English and the Korean, the differences in the Korean and English language, I can't really say much about it because I don't know English. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then she ended it surprising. I hope I trust that um, it's the poems and their English translation are very well fitted language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as for me, um, sort of the slipperiness that Duncan was mentioning, um, Korean and English. Sorry, Soja, your microphone just just dropped oh. at the point. If you could perhaps just repeat that. Oh yes, um, Korean and English are. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Korean and English um, have very different syntax. Um, for example, English is a subject verb object language, and Korean is subject object verb. So, oftentimes, um, many of the important lenders on sort of the dramatic turn of her coming last. And I thought a lot about um, surrealist priming, which is a term that uh, Tom Mandel, who is the English translator of Andre Breton, has written about. Um, so the order of images in a poem really matters in, in all in all poetry, I suppose, but especially in surrealist poetry, where um, the work is meant to subvert or upset expectation, right? So I really sought to retain that order of the Korean. Um, meanwhile, I had the 
for a challenge of having this ridiculous work, uh, language pairing where, you know, if I were to do it in the Korean order, it wouldn't make much sense as an English poem, of course. And especially with the delineated poem, um, that challenge became even more. So that was was always trying to balance in my own work. Thank you so much. Um, I think, uh, I wonder if I could bring Mark back at this stage um, and we can open up to any questions for um, all of you from our audience. And I have one or two uh, questions as well. We have a little time left now um, for a, a broader um, discussion. Um, I wonder, um, I wonder if, uh, if, uh, if I could perhaps ask all of you about the, I, I referred in my introduction to, um, uh, unexpected vanilla to the sexiness of the, the writing. And, uh, I was interested, uh, uh Mark also in <laughs> the, uh, I mean, there, there is some really quite, uh, uh, ex explicit uh, passages uh, in in Gloria's poem um, as well, and I wonder um, if you find that those you know those passages, uh, it, particularly as translators, um, whether you're able, whether these are moments where cultural difference is particularly uh, evident, and there whether they're moments where you have to perhaps tread more carefully or find that you can be more open in your translation than the original. I wonder, uh, perhaps Mark, if I can uh, uh, in invite you to respond to that. Yes. Um, uh, when we were doing these last set of readings, um, uh, I told Gloria that um, there were certain there were certain parts that I couldn't read, N not because of embarrassment, but um, I don't have a clitoris. I can't be, I can't be um, speaking in that voice. And so, it, I mean, it, it, this always from early on was a very interesting question for me. Um, her poem is a poem of female voices of female spirits, of female bodies. Um, I came to the poem as someone who was fascinated by it and um, then started this project with her. So on the one hand, she always was approving of me at translating her work. And, and at the end, um, you know, she said publicly, and, and it was sort of embarrassing and strange to me actually, to, that she said she felt that my translation, some of the time that her po poem, that, that it, it, it's as if it were written in English, which I took as a great compliment, but also as a, I, I wasn't really sure what to do with it beyond a compliment. Um, but I always, so I think what I came to, and it was really, it's great to meet you and, and hear you, uh, Soje, and, <laughs> and both of you, and, and hear, I think we share that similar attentiveness, the, the desire um, that we could go anywhere, which has its own validity, but that our particular interest is to really understand as deeply as we can what it is, what the, what the author is saying, is trying to do, and how do we how do we bring that into English, which the, you know, the directions can be all kinds of, but, but really deeply caring about what is the author trying to do and say. So I'm getting a little lost, but back to, um, <laughs> back to the, I mean, it's such a big topic. Um, so I feel like one of the things I brought was that, that, that I was listening to her. And one of the things, that, that initial thing that connected me to the poem was the poem paying attention to this woman. And so as a translator, me paying attention, not only to the poem, but to, to Gloria, to our relationship, 
Um, in terms of justifying me translating, I think that for me is the justification, both the attention, the ongoing attention and the caring and the checking in with her. Um, and so I feel, I, I'm sure that someone else would, could translate it differently, what I, the same text, um, but my translation, I think comes out of, comes out of a, my relationship with her as well as with the poem. And that um, as a translation, I hope it, it does what she's doing, no matter how erotic she goes, it does it justice. But then in actual reading, I, I couldn't, there are places where I just, I couldn't go. And that, I think that's fine. <laughs> that's where, that's, that's fine. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, Sojay, do you have a, would you like to come in? Yes, Mark, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I, was, I muted myself just to explain the whole clitoris. <laughs> Yeah, she's extremely tickled by it, and I think comforted because we were reading through the judges, um, Rosalind's um, comments, and she was horrified by the quote, um, "joyously horny." <laughs> being exposed internationally for my libido, <laughs> like, I think this is very complimentary. But I think there is a kind of sense of, you know, sudden exposure um, because there was, um, I, and I'd be so curious to um, hear about the Mexican reception to Gloria's work, but um, in Korea, a lot of the reviews and literary criticism have not touched upon these themes that are so central to the collection. And, you know, these are the first things that the judges and English language readers have responded to. So even in um, this famous review of Unexpected Vanilla in Korean, it just says, it talks about love, mm. you know, and it's a, it's a sort of large, you know, um, sweeping um, characterization of all of the different messy, you know, sexual or non-sexual relationships in the poem, in the poetry collection. So, it's great that um, you dove right into, you know, um, even like references to genitalia. Um, yeah, thank you. And in such great admiration and dedication to Gloria's work for over 30 years, we were just talking about it on our way over here, just um, how much our relationship would evolve over the course of 30 years and how that would impact our our respective artistic practices. So yeah, thank you so much, Mark, for modeling that. Well, uh, three things occur to me. First of all, I don't usually you know, talk about female or any genitalia <laughs> in, in, in a public sphere, but, but that was Gloria. And, oh. and, um, and as I said, Gloria, it just amazes me. And I think that's one of the extraordinary things about that should be known about her is that like she never did what she should do. And not just in terms of the sexuality, her, her, um, she was born Jewish in Mexico. And she talks about how many of the people she knew felt like they had to decide between whether they were Jewish or Mexican. And for her, there, that was, there wasn't, there wasn't a question. She somehow was able to be all of who she was without having to, herself navigate borders mm. and um and so and in terms of her reception uh, just two things come to mind in mexico like anywhere even in the U u.s it, it took me years and years and years to find any publisher and and um she was she was she found a way of being published but she she was always under the radar until very recently um, no one really knew what to do with her. Um, and in, she is big in Scandinavia for like 10 or 15 years. <laughs> so in, in Scandinavia about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, she, she started getting invited a lot. And I asked one of the editors recently, like, why is she so popular there? And I mean, there are all kinds of reasons, but you know, is it, I imagine it's sort of the existential questions, which I tend to associate with Scandinavia, Scandinavian poetry. And, and he said, you know, I think 
one of the main reasons is she is really popular among young women, among other people, that feminism is very strong in Scandinavia, but but the explicit, it's very political. This is my understanding of what he was saying. And her talking about the female body has been just opening a, a space, a poetic space for many young poets, especially female poets in Scandinavia. And so, um, yeah, that also, so, so interestingly enough, I don't know if that's been, how directly that's referred to, but apparently for, for that's, been important to many poets trying to find that space for themselves. Thank you, Mark. I, I hadn't expected my question to lead in so many directions. It's wonderful. I don't know, uh, uh, Sojay uh, Himi, if you wanted to come back on, on Mark's point there, or uh, uh, I, I could see, Sojay, you were, uh, you were interpreting for uh, Himi Yes, it's an interesting triage situation with Jenny also on the Zoom call. Uh, but Hemi just wanted to say that um, we are experiencing quite a similar thing where the international reception for Unexpected Vanilla has been much in more in tune with her original intent. <laughs> and, mm. and, um, yeah, and I think, as she said, there is a kind of uh, avoidance in the Korean literary um, establishment um, of the very explicit things that she references. Um, and there is a kind of freer, um, うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、うん、う